Good morning and welcome to Solid Rock Church in Bolton Landing, New York. Uh, my name is Daniel Valentin and it's good to see all your faces. I'm excited to bring forth God's word. So, you know, if you have seatbelts on, fasten them. I mean, you guys don't, right? <laughs> but uh, it's always a privilege to be able to bring God's words with God's people, to God's people. Um, last week, we looked at the foundation, barriers, and benefits of Christian fellowship. Uh, we learned that Christian fellowship, in, in a sentence, I pretty much summed the whole sermon up, that Christian fellowship is sharing the life of Jesus together. And throughout the sermon, I kept saying that um, if you miss any sermons, we have our website. Our brother put, puts all the sermons in there so you can go through it in your pace. Uh, I know sometimes I, I have a lot of scripture and, you know, it's, it's a lot of writing if you are writing. So you can go, you can pause, <laughs> do what you do on your pace. But we have all the sermons posted on our website. Uh, and yeah, last week, so we looked at Christian fellowship, but we also have to recognize that Christian fellowship can exist if Jesus Christ is not the center of it. And that was one of the main things that I was saying last week. If Jesus is not the center of Christian fellowship, it's not really Christian fellowship. It's just people getting together. So, so today, I want us to look at a truth that many of us are familiar with, that I hope that we could fully grasp today. And the truth that I want uh, us to really grasp is that Jesus is pursuing a relationship with you today. And I'm not talking about a relationship, uh, a high and by relationship. You, we have those relationships. You go to the store, you may see a neighbor, you're like, hey, bye. I'm not talking about that type of relationship. I'm talking about the relationship that you actually sit with a individual. You speak to them. You hear them. You speak to them, and then they speak to you. And that's the type of relationship the Lord wants with us. He doesn't want a high and by. He wants us to be able to spend time with him. Share your heart. I mean, he knows what's going on, but he wants us to share these things to him. But then he also wants us to sit and listen. Sometimes we pour everything out and we forget the listening part. You know, God wants to speak to you. Um, he cares about you. He cares about what you're going through. And he wants to give you that strength. And the strength comes through his word. One of the practices that I, I started, which is, um, is just blessed me, is just opening the Bible like the Psalms. Like if you want to start somewhere, just read the Psalms. And after you read a Psalm, then start praying it. Speak it back to the Lord. Go back. And, you know, some things you may pass, but there's things, this is the word of God. And, and that'll help you not only to um, speak to God by using the word, but it's also that the word starts to become part of you. And we want the word to become part of us because, you know, thank God that we live in a country that even though with the midst of chaos, everything that's going on, we're able to still have this. Amen. You know, there's countries that they have to smuggle this in the country. But we, are, we have access to this, and the enemy knows that, and the enemy doesn't want us to open this. So that's why there's so much in America, right? We, are, we get distracted with everything, TV, e every type of thing that we can have. And, and a lot of it is distractions so that we don't open this and see what God says about you and what he wants to share you know, to you because each one of you are called for a purpose. Amen? So... I just want to encourage you also, we do have our Wednesday Bible study. If you're able to make it out, we were going through the Gospel of John. And it's, it's so nice to be able to sit in a room and not only listen, which is great, but then you have discussion time. If you don't understand something, you can actually ask those questions in the Bible study. So I want to encourage you, if you're able, uh, I, I know that this part of the year, everyone's getting really busy. And I've seen it. I went downtown, and I'm starting to see a lot more people than when I first started coming. And, and, and I hear that it's going to be a lot more. <laughs> but I look at it as opportunity for us. So, hey, the harvest is plenty. The workers are few. So we're going to go with what we have. And um, 
I know God's going to be glorified and people are going to come to know the Lord, even if they don't stay here in Solid Rock Church. But my prayer is that they leave Bolton Landing, leave this community with Jesus and bring it to where they're going. So, um, so I'm excited about uh, this summer and, and yeah, I'm just ready. I'm just ready. I'm, re- I'm looking forward to it. So um, let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you for this beautiful day, Lord God, that we can gather, Lord, with, without fear, Lord God, knowing, Lord God, that we could um, worship you, Lord God. We don't have to be afraid of doors being broken down, Lord. But, Lord, um, we want to acknowledge those things that you've given us, Lord God. And in the midst of everything here where we live in America, we put on the TV and we see how far they are moving from you, Lord God. But, Lord, you still have given us so much, Lord God, here. And, Lord, I pray, Lord God, that we may use the resources that you've given us, Lord God, for your glory, Lord. That um, they may be a time we don't have it, Lord God. But, Lord, my heart's desire is that your words become part of us, Lord God. That if one day, Lord God, that they start trying to rip the Bibles from our hands, Lord God, your words would be so deep into our hearts, Lord God, that we'd be able to speak them, Lord God. So, Lord, um, I pray protection over each one of us. So I pray, Lord, now for this um, message, Lord God, that it may, again, fall on good soil, Lord God, that you may have your way, that you may direct us, Lord God, throughout this day and throughout the week and throughout our life, Lord God, that you may always be the center of everything we do, Lord God. So we give you all the glory and honor. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray, Lord. Amen. All right, so the the title of this message is The Need of the Righteous One. And I'm going to be reading from Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. It's going to be from the New King James Version. And if you have your pew Bibles, I believe it's in 1039. So if you want to follow along with the pew Bibles, um, feel free. So it will be Luke 19, verses 1 through 10. All right. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation. I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. Blessed be the words of our Lord. So let me, uh, before we get into it, I'm going to give you some context so we can understand what's going on in the text and it's so important like when you read the word to we can read the scripture but it's important to know the background what's happening um and i I believe it just becomes more richer and you could get under the surface so what's going on this is um jesus is entering um his final week on earth and you know he's this is pretty much moving to the grand finale. And we know what the grand finale was, was the cross and his resurrection. And Jesus is the star of this story. And in all the stories, if you really look, he's, Jesus is always a star. God's always a star. And it begins with him passing through Jericho um, on this final week. See, Jesus um, moves from Jericho and he, he's going to Jerusalem. So this is where he's actually traveling. And Jericho was a significant import and export post. And all, it was a well-known toll place in Palestine, especially for goods passing east and west between Judea and Perea. In, ancient, in the ancient world, Jericho was the life. This was the Las Vegas of the ancient world. 
uh, Josephus, who was a Jewish historian, and if he wrote a lot of things that, uh, like scholars, they, they, they're able to look at the background on things that, to kind of um, see if what the scriptures are saying is true. He wrote a lot of these things in the background, historical um, background, so we can kind of see if, if, if uh, Josephus was right as well. But um, he called Jericho the fattest city in the land, um, which meant that it was a wealthy and prosperous city. Uh, also, Jericho was below sea level and Jerusalem was above sea level. So it was a steep climb for Jesus and his disciples when they, they wanted to get to Bethany, which was the outskirts of Jerusalem um, before the Sabbath. And then Jesus would present himself in the city of Jerusalem. And we know that, um, you know, they, that was a, a big event, um, Jesus going through Jerusalem. See, Jesus was marching towards Jerusalem for his final sacrifice on the cross. And Jesus' reputation was already well known throughout the region. You see, outside of, of Jericho, Jesus um, healed a blind man. So he already had a, cl- a crowd following him. Some of the people in the crowd, um, uh, they, they believed that Jesus was going to Jerusalem to deliver them. So they wanted to see Jesus deliver them from the grip of Rome. So it was a big deal. He had people following him. Then there were some people that were just following him to see what the next miracle was. So there was a big mixture here that was around him. See, Israel... Uh, again, was under Rome, the Roman rule, which meant economic and social problems. Uh, it, uh, Rome was an oppressive government. Uh, slavery was there. Um, all the work all over the empire was mostly done by slaves. Uh, you have heavy taxes, hurt, which hurt small businesses and farmers, corrupt politicians, trade disruptions, over-cultivation, which um, farms lost their productivity, bloody games, uh, and we see this, we, I mean, there's movies out, you, you have like Gladiator, we see what was happening in the Colosseum and how all the, the emperor was throwing people into uh, the, the Colosseum to get murdered by lions and all kinds of um, detestable things that was happening in Rome. Um, they had ordered suicides, murder, sexual morality, riots because people were fed up of the oppressive government. So there was a lot of riots and zealots, um, which was another sect of the Jews. They were very um, radical. They they were one of the ones that would lead these things. Uh, They also had religious persecution. So there was a lot going on that the Jews were going through in Rome. A lot of anger, a lot of um, confusion. And they were looking for someone to deliver them from that. And they were hoping... It was Jesus, and it was, but they just saw it a different way when Jesus was looking at the big problem, which was sin, and which is sin, right? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through him. So he's the answer, and Jesus was seeing behind the scenes. He knew what the important thing was and what he was delivering them from. So we have all this. Then you have these tax collectors who worked for the Roman Empire. And they earned their living by adding extra surcharge for themselves. Uh, These Jewish tax tax collectors were considered traitors and were banned from the synagogue. They were on the same level. They put them on the same level as thieves, murderers, and prostitutes, these tax collectors. They were considered to be sinners because they did not live by the law of Moses. And Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector who ruled through the government agencies and managed wealth really in a irresponsible but legal manner according to the Roman government standards. He most likely had others working for him throughout the region collecting taxes. So not only was he a tax collector, he had a team of tax collectors and he was leading them. He was a manager. He had people going collecting money and and what happens is he had these people collecting money and they were ripping off uh, their own Jewish brothers. They would get, charge them more, and Zacchaeus would get his cut because they worked for him. Zacchaeus worked for Rome, and they worked for him. So Zacchaeus was getting money from his own transactions and also from these team of tax collectors, and we don't know how many he had, but we do know that he was very wealthy. 
Uh, you see, this was a corrupt empire, and these, ta uh, these Jewish tax collectors were trying to make a living by collecting taxes from their own people. And Zacchaeus was like many people today, separating what we do from who we are. And, you know, as a believer, you're a believer wherever you're at, and you need to represent Christ wherever you're at. I know there are certain places that they don't allow you to say certain things, but again, I would say, let the Holy Spirit guide you. When you're spending time with the Lord, He's going to tell you when it's time to speak. And that's why we need to be sensitive to His voice, because there may be times that we need to speak, and it may not be in a context that we're norm is normally we would speak, but the Holy Spirit is, is, is directing us to do it. And I would urge you, listen to Him. There's a reason. But the only way we can get to that place is when you're spending time with the Lord and you're hearing from him. We don't want to be guessing these things. You know, you truly want to hear from the Lord. So we have Zacchaeus uh, um, being the chaf uh, chief um, tax collector. And we have to tell ourselves, are we simply trying to make a living? Are, is, is this what we're doing? Are we just trying to make a living or... Are we, do we, are we really walking this, this life for Christ out? And, you know, you can make a living, like I said. But remember, first and foremost, you're children of the living God. If you've accepted Jesus Christ in your life, that has to be, you need to shine. We're called to be the salt and light in this world. We don't want to be hidden. You don't want something to go over us. We, we want to shine for Christ. So, um, and I say this because I know that we're, we're getting into a place right now where more people are coming. And, and I don't know what's happening in your ind individual lives, you know, but I, I, I feel an urge of I need to do more. You, you, this life is getting shorter and shorter. I'm getting older and older. I'll tell you, you know, you know I, and every day that passes, you're getting closer, correct? I mean, either the Lord's going to come which he is, he's either going to come in my lifetime or I'm leaving. But either way, I have to face him. And while I'm here, there's a urgency in my heart that I need to live for him. You know, these are the things that we, this is the most important thing in life, that we need to live for him. Um, there's people that are lost in our families, our friends, our neighbors, wherever, you know, I mean, just, again, you just put on the news and it's like, where is this society going? And we have the answer. So, yeah, so there is an urgency in my heart, and I pray that this urgency, you feel it too, and I know that God will use you. God will use you. Just be faithful, and he'll give you the words to say. Sometimes we may not have the words, but Allow him to use you. I mean, he used Peter, and Peter was a fisherman. I mean, they, that's why they were confused. They were like, how is this guy talking? I used to see him on the docks way back, and I heard what he used to say. These fishermen weren't like the, the best <laughs> of the crew. And that's why I love that Jesus didn't look for the, the biggest Pharisee with the best coat. No, he looked for those that, that they were normal. That, that, that's good. Praise God. Yeah. Normal. You know, um, not prestigious. But you see, Jesus was looking at the heart. And, and we can't make um, assumptions of people. People are going through things, and we're like, oh, God's not going to save that one. I could say that for a fact because my mom prayed for me. And I know people looked at me, and they were like, I don't know about that guy. You know, mom is wasting her time on that guy. But Praise God, you know, I'm here today and I could say how much I love the Lord and, and I could actually, I'm a pastor and that's only God. That's only God and all glory to him. So, so let's, so Zacchaeus, we see in the story that Zacchaeus wants to see Jesus more than he wanted to maintain his economic uh, comfort. And the beauty is Jesus knew that. Jesus already knew that. He, he already could see his heart. And, and you have this man, rich, wealthy man, putting everything aside, not caring, looking for Jesus, while Jesus 
was already looking for him. And it, it, it reminds me of the story of um, when Jesus goes to um, Samaria uh, with the woman at the well. He could have went around it, and they were confused, but there was a purpose. Jesus was meeting this woman where she was at. And that's what he does, which is beauty. He'll meet you where you're at. So I know some people, are, they, they may say, well, I need to get right. I, I'm not right yet. I can't, I, can't, I can't see Jesus. I need to fix this and that. No, Jesus wants to meet you where you're at. And then that's when the change starts. When you repent and you give it to him, then you can carry what it says that my yoke is light, right? You don't need to carry all this baggage that we normally do. Give it to him. He's there for us. Amen. So, so Jesus already knew this. And, and in the last chapter, Luke 18, verses 18 to 23, we see Jesus on his way to Jericho. And he's confronted by a rich young ruler who says, good teacher or master, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, you know the commandments, right? The rich young ruler says um, he, he has kept them since his youth. And Jesus tells him that he still lacks one thing. And I love Mark 10, 21. It, it, it talks about this account. It says that Jesus was looking at him and loved him. And then he tells him. See, it wasn't just questioning. Jesus loved him. And that's the thing. Jesus, the Lord loves people. He doesn't want anyone to perish. There's no one in this world that God's like, I want that person to perish. No, he wants no one to perish. This is why he died on the cross. And uh, so, so it, I love that. that he, it says that he loved him. Then he tells him. And then it says Jesus tells him to sell all his possessions and distribute it to the poor. And the rich young ruler went away sorrowful because he was rich. And Jesus says, how hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. See, those that had heard him say this responded, who then can be saved? But Jesus says something very profound. He says this, he says, the things that are impossible with men are possible with God. Amen. We serve a living God. There's nothing impossible for our God. See, it's difficult for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God, but not impossible. And we see this now. There's rich people going into the kingdom of God. Amen. And other things, you know, people that were, uh, suffer from addiction, drinking, abuse, whatever it is. We see how the Lord changes their heart, softens their heart. And there's a radical change. And, and you see it. Everyone that sees that individual is like, wow, what happened to him? And many of us were that person that would be like, whoa. And they look at you now. It's like, how has God change that man or woman so you're you're a living testimony of that in your life so we have the how the lord could change if we just surrender completely to him see jesus had come to jericho that day seeking to save the lost and he knew that zacchaeus like he he, he knew he, uh, like zacchaeus like he knows each one of us today uh he knew who he was and he knows who you are. He knows where you're coming from. He knows your baggage. It's not a surprise to him. So don't be afraid to come to him. Amen. He still wants that relationship with you. See, the crowd, crowds around Zacchaeus um, had deemed him unworthy of the encounter that was about to occur. But God did not see him this way. See, Jesus saw Zacchaeus' heart and drew him to himself. Each one of us should find hope in this story because literally or figuratively, we have compromised in our lives. Perhaps in our work by failing to live fully the implications of our faith. Perhaps in our family by failing to love in the way that we, that we ought sacrificially. And uh, a few weeks ago, I talked about this type of love, this agape love, this sacrificial love. This is the love that God teaches us, that wants us to love with. Perhaps in our free time by giving into pursuits that, would, that we know that are actually leads us into bondage. So we need to break away from those things. See, the good news is that no matter what has happened in our past, Jesus walks into the dusty streets of our own lives and comes for us. He meets you where you're at. See, Jesus is pursuing a relationship with you today, an intimate relationship. Again, not a high and by. He wants an intimate relationship with you today. 
So I want to look at um, three areas in this text. The first is um, seeking, encountering, and then salvation. So we're going to look at those three things within this text. Uh, so let's look at this first point, which is seeking. See, in these verses, we read about the man named Zacchaeus. And again, Zacchaeus was the chief tax collector in all of Jericho. And we read here that he, had, he was very wealthy. He was a very wealthy man. He most likely became wealthy through his occupation, not through where he was born. It was through his job and, and what, he, what he took on. Zacchaeus most likely heard about Jesus and was curious about the one they claimed was the friend of tax collectors and sinners. We see this in Luke uh, chapter 7, verse 34. So remember, Jesus was already popular. People were already talking. And Zacchaeus could have been walking down the street. He could have heard about this. You see, there was a hole still here. He, pro he probably didn't understand it, but there was a hole here. And he's like, I need to see him. Everyone, think about it. Chief tax collector. People looked at him, sneered at him when he walked by. Couldn't stand him. Maybe his own tax collectors that were working for him didn't like him because he, he was taking money from them too. So they had to be hated because of him because they had to charge more because they had to give him a cut. So it's like this man was a hated man where he was at. So what's interesting is that Zacchaeus' name means the righteous one. You see, he collected money from his own friends, if he had any, um, and his neighbors, and yet he was called by the name Righteous One. See, back in the day and time, a person's name was to reveal to one and to all of his or her destiny. People would see the name and they, they can relate it to what he's going to do in life. Um, it, it, it was related to his future character and personality. See, it's likely that he had parents who were devout worshipers of the God of Israel. And they had raised Zacchaeus in the ways of Yahweh because of this name. Again, a name was very important. If, uh, if, if he was named, his parents weren't worshipers, most likely they wouldn't pick a name to say the righteous one. There was a purpose for that name. See, Zacchaeus' destiny was to carry on his family's religious beliefs and to walk in the ways of the Lord and, and truly be righteous. But it apparently gone astray. He, he went astray. He was like, no, like many of us, my parents were believers. And I was like, that's great for you, but I'm going to do me. And it's not until that moment when you realize there's a hole and you need to fill one. The only one that could fill that, it was Jesus. And that's why in 1996, I was, when they did that altar call, I was the first one in the altar because I knew. I didn't even care. I remember growing up, they used to do altar calls. I was like, okay, I'm embarrassed. You know, you're embarrassed. You're like, I don't want to get, or when it's time to worship, you're like, I don't, I'm not putting my hands up. And now it's like, I worship, I don't care. That moment when I received Jesus into my life, I remember I was just waiting and he said, if you want to receive, I was up there just bawling. And, and, and I'm just so thankful for that, for that opportunity that he never gave up on me. And he's not giving up on your families, those that are not believers. He's not giving up on them. So don't give up on them. Keep praying. Keep praying because God is able. As long as they have breath in their life, in their lungs, there's hope. Amen. And, and Jesus gives us that hope. So I'm so glad for that because I have uh, family members that I'm praying for. And I can't wait to hear the testimony of them, you know, surrendering to the Lord. So it must have been a very painful time and difficult time for Zacchaeus, even though he was rich. Uh, with the knowledge that he was the, defying his family's wishes that he was going against God's plan for his life. People probably said that, you know, what kind of Jew are you? And they, the Jewish people, they knew what name signified. So like, yeah, right, righteous one. And then who knows what they said to him. Poor, poor Zacchaeus in his Lamborghini probably drove away all sad. No. <laughs> See, we read here that Zacchaeus was short stature meaning that he wasn't very tall in height. 
And I don't want anyone here, don't be saying, oh, Pastor, you're short stature. Do not say that to me, please. <laughs> don't say that. <laughs> At that time, um, I was actually reading about the average size of a grown man was five foot tall, five feet tall. So I would have I felt good. I would be like, yes. <laughs> you know? But um, so, so we have to think Zacchaeus was under five feet tall. If the average size was five feet, he was under so he was probably like my, my daughter or son's age. And he probably had this real expensive coat walking around, and people are looking at him like, you know, you, you get upset with that too. It's like, man, this guy, look at him. He's all rich, walking around like he's tough. <laughs> so when Jesus comes in town, they're probably like, make a wall. He doesn't deserve to even be in the, he doesn't deserve to see Jesus at all. You see, so according to the Bible, Zacchaeus, again, was a short man, but it seems also that at this particular time, as he met Jesus, he was short spiritually. You see, when we are out of God's will for, um, for our lives, there is a spiritual battle being fought inside of us, and we are being cut down from what our spiritual sides could really be. And we see this. If you have the living God in you, and this battle, sometimes we start doubting what God could do through you. Remember, the Holy Spirit, the living God, if you go outside, look at the stars, look at the, the moon, look at the trees, that same God created you. That same God dwells within you. You have the living God within you, and at times we doubt. And when we doubt, we're doubting God. God could you use, use you in many different ways, but again, the only way is when you're in that relationship with him. He leads you. He guides you. He tells you when, you know, now it's time. Do this. You know, you're going to start being sensitive to his voice. And when you start reading his word, it becomes part of you. The words start coming out in conversations. All of a sudden, you're speaking the word because it's become part of you. We don't want to uh, have this relation that we're not into this in the word. And then we're trying to speak truth, but we don't know it. We don't know the truth. So, so you have a... Uh, um, little short Zacchaeus walking around and he hears about Jesus. <laughs> see, see, so remember um, uh, Zacchaeus' name, it means a righteous one. See, God may have directed us to walk down the path of righteousness while we have chosen another path and then we become torn apart on the inside. So God called you to do one thing and we're doing the other and then you feel that battle inside. It's like, I was never meant to do this. And, and, I, and I went through that when I worked in the bank. I remember I felt the Lord calling me. And I was in the bank, and I felt that, like, I needed to, to do ministry. I needed to finish my school. And, again, it's different for everyone. I just know that the Lord was saying, it's time. And, you know, every time I was like, well, you know, I got a mortgage. I, I'm, I, Lord, I, I, maybe I missed it. Maybe you're not really saying what I think you're saying. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I stood and it got to the point that it was like I wasn't going to move. So the Lord started moving me, pushing me out. Things were happening, and all of a sudden, I left the bank job, and there was a journey of God teaching me. I've had mentors in my life, and that's what he does. You, know, that, um, you don't want to be in that battle. Don't, don't fight against God. You're, you're always going to lose, first off, but you kind of prolong you know, you're, you're, you're fighting and you're just going to get depressed while you're fighting because you're not walking where he wants you to walk. Amen? So um, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this. It says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Through Jesus, we have righteousness through him. We become the righteousness of God in him. Amen? See, when we are out of God's will for our lives, we feel very small in spirit. When we sin against God, we are ashamed. We feel very short and extremely small inside. And let's remember that all sin is against God. There's no good sin. All sin is against God. Sin is sin. The key has likely felt what many of us feel when we are out of God's will. See, when we are out of the Lord's will, we can feel depressed. We can feel angry, empty, which I, I felt, um, guilty, fearful, doubtful. See, when you're out of God's will, these are things and, and, and a, a, a long list of other things that you start feeling when you're out of God's will. 
See, Zacchaeus may have been down on the inside, but Jesus was about to pass that way. And he had a desire to get close to him, as close to him as he could. So Zacchaeus was like, he's going through here. I'm going to get as close to him as I can. And, you know, a few weeks ago, I shared how the lame man, how his four friends, they brought their lame friend, they climbed the roof, dug through the roof, and, and um, they put their friend down in front of Jesus. And I, I, I said this to you guys, that um, what would you do? How far? What's the extent that you would go to bring your loved one to Christ? Like, what are you willing to do to bring your loved one to Christ? But then we come to this story. And instead of bringing your loved one, how far would you go? to get into that deep relationship with the Lord, that intimate relationship. What are you willing to do to get into that intimate relationship, to know the heart of God? What are you willing to do? And that's a question that I would ask you today, and for myself too. What things are God telling you? These are the things that need to change. These are the things you need to shake off and put over here because they're they're not good for you, and they're blocking what I want to do in your life. So, so we have uh, Zacchaeus um, coming to the Lord, and again, his desire is to see, see Jesus as close as he can. He's, he's trying to get as close to, to Jesus as he can. And, and though he found a spark of new life, we see in um, 19 um, verse 4, it says, and he ran before. So all of a sudden, he's running. He ran before and climbed up a sycamore tree to see him. For he was to pass that way. See, I wonder what people must have thought that knew Zacchaeus. Again, they see this man walking down the street, very serious, collecting money, having a group of tax collectors probably meeting with him. And all of a sudden, they see this man with his dressy gown running. You see, at that time, uh, you wouldn't see a, a government official running. A rich man would not run. They walk. You know, and all of a sudden you see Zacchaeus running around like a child, not only running, now he's climbing a tree. That's like my son. My son could look like Zacchaeus outside if he climbed a tree. They're, they were the same height and, <laughs> and everything. <laughs> but, but you have Zacchaeus not caring what people are saying at that moment. And he's running and climbing a tree. See, as Zacchaeus, uh, it says that, um, well, there was just something about, there was just something about Jesus that called out to him that he didn't care. And when he climbed that, the tree and he ran, that was a, a sign of humility. He humbled himself to God at that moment and did not care what anyone would think about him. All he cared about was what Jesus um, thought of him. And he wanted to see Jesus with his own eyes. See, Zacchaeus may have been small in spirit, but he wasn't small in character. See, he may have been small in stature, but he wasn't small in nature. Many of us are traveling down the wrong path for our lives, even though Jesus Christ is calling us to follow him. You see, when Jesus called you to follow him, it wasn't, Jesus wasn't saying, just follow me for a little bit. No, he's saying, follow me for life. See what I have for you. See what I have for your family. See what I have for your friends. Everyone that comes in contact with you, see what I have for them because I want to use you. Again, we go through scripture. We see how the Lord uses men and women that you would think, how? But that's what he does. God can use you. He can use me. So, So just, just like Zacchaeus, many of us, we feel small and helpless. You see, when Jesus passes their way, their reason is that it's too hard to change to follow him. Again, that's one thing that goes through. It's too much. It's too much. Am I, I'm going to have to give this up. I'm going to have to give that up. See, they tend to complain that they can't reach Jesus for all the obstacles in their way, and they just give up. Uh, Many allow other people to hinder them from reaching Christ by holding on to past grudges and keeping bitterness in their heart. That's a big thing. You hold on to these unforgiveness, bitterness, 
is a tactic of the enemy because he doesn't want you to move forward. And then all of a sudden, when you're trying to move forward, a trigger happens and puts you back to where you originally were. You see, Jesus wants you to be free from that. He wants to take that from you. And the only way is through full surrender. Zacchaeus could have chosen to have become angry at his parents for giving him this name, Righteous One. And he could have refused to come to Jesus because he felt like religion had been forced upon him by his parents all his life. See, there were people there that day who could have hindered Zacchaeus from coming to Jesus for he was hated. We read that the large crowd of people who were much taller than he was blocking his view. Zacchaeus could have complained and said that there were too many people in his way. However, he didn't offer up any excuses for his spiritual or physical state. He was both small in height and in spirit, but he mustered up the strength and the shrewdness to rise above the crowd of people and, and in order to look upon the Savior. See, people that sincerely desire to see Jesus will use proper means that it might take to see him and will break through a deal of difficulty and opposition and be willing to take pains to see him. What would you do to get to know Jesus, that relationship? What are you willing to do? See, for people that find themselves little in whatever the situation may be, must take all the advantages, advantages they can to raise themselves to a place in order to see him. Zacchaeus was very small in height and in spirit, and there was a large crowd separating him from Jesus, but he had the desire to overcome his obstacles. See, if we have the desire to see Jesus, we will find him. The Word of God says that if you draw near to me, I will draw near to you. And that's truth right there. If you draw near to him, he will draw near to you. So we see this idea of seeking, and then we come to the second point of encountering. See, Jesus was not all at all surprised as Zacchaeus was in a sycamore tree. Jesus knew exactly where he was. It says in verse 4 that Zacchaeus climbed the sycamore fig tree, which was often planted by the roadside, which makes sense because Jesus was passing through that area. Since the sycamore fig tree, have, they actually have large um, leaves as well as low branches, Zacchaeus may have hoped to remain unseen. So he probably just wanted to see Jesus. And he probably was hiding behind, like a child, hiding behind this big leaf so he wasn't being seen. You know? So he, was, he climbed this tree hiding. And um, you see, the, the fig leaves symbolize the eschatological signs that your redemption is drawing near. And you see this in Luke 21, verses 28 through 31. See, and these were the leaves Zacchaeus was hiding behind. But Zacchaeus was getting set up by Jesus like many of us today have been. I was set up by Jesus. Jesus knew exactly what to do. And it was a setup when I came to the Lord. And this is what's happening in Zacchaeus' life right now. So we look at Luke 19, verses 5 through 6. It says, And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. From these verses, we see that Zacchaeus thought he was seeking Jesus, but Jesus was really seeking him. We read in Romans 3.11, There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks after God. You see, when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden by eating the forbidden fruit, they hid from God. But God came looking for them, and he asked them this in verse 9 in chapter 3. He says, Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? See, now, now where are you, Adam? God, God asked. He, was, he, was, it wasn't, he knew where he was at. He was looking for a confession. He was looking for him to come out. But Adam was afraid, and we know the story there because we're here today, right? We would have been in the garden, and everything would have been perfect outside. <laughs> but you see, the Lord is asking us this same question today. Where are you? Where are you, Daniel? He's asking me that question. Where are you? He wants an intimate relationship with you and me. So in verse 5, 
Jesus says, Achaeus, make haste and come down. You see, when Jesus seeks us, he calls us by our name as he did Zacchaeus, for he, knew, he knows his chosen ones by name. And we see this in verse, uh, chapter 10, verse 3 of the Gospel of John. It says that Jesus says in, in this, he says, To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. See, Jesus also tells Zacchaeus that he must stay at his home. This is the only instance in the four Gospels where Jesus invites himself to someone's house, which is interesting. Usually everyone was inviting him, but Jesus invites himself. And that's scary. Sometimes, you know, like people, if people just invite themselves in your house, you're like, oh, I need to clean. There's a lot. You see, we go back to this, I need to clean. But Jesus is inviting himself into your house. Uh, you, you may, don't, don't say, I'll have to sweep up, Lord. I got to do this. No, he's inviting himself to your house. So let's answer him the way Zacchaeus said. It says, most, li- most likely he was actually going for a meal too. I mean, he wanted to sit with Jesus, but that was an intimate thing. You, you break bread with those that come to your home. And that was something that was known. That this is what we're going to do now. Say, we're going to break bread together. We're going to speak to each other. We're going to fellowship with one another. But remember, Christ has to be the center of this, right? We're all believers, and that's the beauty of us coming together. So, oh, Revelations 3.20 says this. It says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him, and he with me. You see, Zacchaeus heard the knock, and he answered. You see, that's exactly what Jesus did. Um, Zacchaeus opened the door of his heart, and he went to his house and had dinner with Zacchaeus. See, if you hear Jesus calling your name, then he is knocking on the door to your heart and telling you that he wants you to become one of his own beloved sheep. See, there's one thing, you become a believer, right? But then I, I, there's, there's compartments, rooms that are, are closed, right, to God. We're like, we're going to hold on to that. And that's the, that's the things that as you become a Christian, you're letting go of those things. Surrender everything to him. Don't hold back and say, Lord, uh, I'll leave you in this area of my life. But this area, that's for me. No, when you surrender to the Lord, surrender all to the Lord. Um, and, and that's what he wants. He, we, we serve a jealous God. He wants all of your devotion, not part of it. And, and that's what this uh, society is doing, right? It's pulling us away. You know, even churches are doing things that, that normally wouldn't be done. I mean, it's like it's, it's against scripture, but they're doing it. And, and believers are being pulled apart. And it's, it's not what we're, you know, that's not supposed to happen. <laughs> so, um, so Jesus goes uh, and he, he's, he goes to his home. He's eating with him. See, Jesus calls him by name, righteous one, Zacchaeus, which is beautiful. Because when Jesus calls your name, it's just like when I think it was Mary. Was it Mary when he said Mary, when he rose? It's something about his name. When, when, when Jesus says your name, it's just a connection because you see the love behind it. There's no agenda behind what he's doing. The only thing is that he loves you and he wants the best for you. He's not holding out on you like, like Satan would try, like he did in the Garden of Eden, how he was trying to tell Eve. God's not holding out on you. He doesn't want to hold out. The only way that he can hold out is when you're not moving in the direction that he wants you to move because he wants to give you everything that he possibly can and use you beyond what even your mind could even comprehend. So Jesus is pursuing a relationship with you and I today. See, if he calls our name, it means he has chosen us. So we can't hesitate to answer his call. In verses 5 through 6, we see that when Jesus invited himself to Zacchaeus' house, Zacchaeus received him joyfully. And we see this in the passage. Um, Joy is one of the key themes in this gospel of Luke. And the word is found over 20 times in one form or another. See, when Jesus calls us by name and invites us to become one, one of his own beloved and chosen sheep, he desires to bring joy into people's lives. Not doom, not doubt, not dread. He wants to bring joy into our lives. See, joy is a quality and not simply an emotion. And it's grounded upon God himself and certainly comes from God. 
See, joy is something that we receive from God, and because it comes from the eternal God, it's something that endures and lasts for all of eternity. And that's for you and me. It is something that remains with us even through times of great difficulty. But it says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. We need to hold on to that. See, joy is truly a gift from God. Joy is something that is stable in an unstable world. And those of us who are trying to follow God and trying also to follow a life of sin are both mentally and spiritually unstable. See, those people are double-minded. And James 1.8 says this. It says, such a person is double-minded and unstable in all, they, all that they do. See, Jesus came to bring stability to Zacchaeus in, a, in his unstable life. He came to bring him joy, and he wants to give each of us joy as well. See, Jesus is pursuing a relationship with you today, church. So we come to this last point, salvation. Um, Luke 19, verses 7 through 10 says this. It says, but when they saw it, they all complained. These are the people saying, he has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he, he also is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. You see, here the crowd becomes the obstacle again. Compl they complain about Zacchaeus, who was a tax collector and a sinner. See, they put him with a group of people that were despised and rejected. See, whenever you do something for the Lord, people complain. They don't want you to, to move in the right direction. You're always going to run into obstacles. But you need to push forward. Don't let people tell you what what you're, you can do or who you are in Christ. And that's where, again, the relationship comes in because you hold on to that. you like, I am a child of the living God. I am more than a conqueror. And you push forward. See, whenever you do something for the Lord, again, people will complain. You will receive obstacles. Obstacles will be in front of you. None of us like to be judged. And all too often when people judge us, when we tend to believe what they say about us, and when we let, let it hold us back from becoming who God wants us to be. And you know who he wants us to be? His righteousness. That's who he wants us to be. But when we start letting the lies and people tell us what we are, and it's not true. He wants us to be his righteousness in this world See, many times people don't come to Jesus Christ and accept him as Lord and Savior because they're worried too much about what people may think. That's how I was when I was younger. And that's not a fully surrendered heart. I was, I was like, oh, you know, if I go up, people are going to talk. You know, I have maybe someone was there. And obviously, if people are in the church, most of them are seeking, you know, but that's how the enemy messes with you. It's like, oh, they're going to say something. But really, they, they're actually supporting that. <laughs> See, Zacchaeus didn't let his short height or smallness of spirit hinder him from becoming large in spirit through Jesus Christ. He had the character to persevere in the face of obstacles, criticism, and he aimed straight for Jesus. It was not Zacchaeus' fault that he was little of stature and could not see over the crowd. He did what he could to overcome his handicap by putting aside his dignity and climbing a tree. Again, Zacchaeus humbled himself. And that's what we need to do. You want to get closer to God? Humble yourself. Humble yourself. In Luke 18, 14, it says this. Jesus is responding to the parable he gave regarding the Pharisee and the tax collector. And he says this. I tell you, this man, he's talking about the tax collector, went down to his house justified rather than the other, which was the Pharisee. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. See, in a spiritual sense, all of us are of little stature. 
Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 3, 23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. See, no one measures up to God's high standards. We are all too little to enter heaven by ourselves. See, the tragedy is many of the lost think that they are too big. See, they measure themselves by man's standards, money, position, power, authority, popularity, things that may not be right in, this, in the sight of God. See, they think that they have everything when they really have nothing. And if you don't have Jesus, you have nothing. All this is none of it's going with you. Um, Luke 9, 8 says this when we read how Zacchaeus offers to give half of all his possessions to the poor and pay four times to anyone he may have cheated, which is the highest price found in Exodus 22, um, um, Exodus chapter 22, verse 1, and the stiffest penalty according to the law of Moses. So if you, if you later on look at Exodus 22, verse 1, and you can see Zacchaeus knew something, right? He was brought up. He must have been brought up in a, a religious home because he knew this, and he actually spoke it out. So he knew he wasn't doing something right. See, this was evidence of a changed heart, an act demonstrating faith. And it's beautiful because before I spoke of the rich man that went off, um, hopefully he came back. We, you know, we think of that. He may have come back. It doesn't say anything, but... But we see the struggle when you have a lot. People don't want to give it up, right? Whatever it is, when you have a lot, and we see how Zacchaeus is. For him, all of it was nothing if Jesus wasn't there. And he's willing to give whatever needs to be given to make right what he'd done. So Zacchaeus may have felt small in height and in spirit, but after he encountered Jesus, his life completely changed. Like many of us, our life completely changed when you encounter Jesus. See, God takes the initiative in offering forgiveness, but there can be no salvation without repentance. It demands change of your heart and mind about what's important in life, and then a change of your life accordingly. Zacchaeus shows change after his encounter with Jesus, the righteous one. Luke, uh, the beginning of Luke uh, 3.8, uh, John the Baptist says, he says this, prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned of God. The only way you can see that is through the fruit. That's how you know someone has changed. If there's no fruit, there is a problem in that, in that conversion. See, as God initiates restoration with Zacchaeus, we see Zacchaeus initiate restoration with others. All of a sudden now he say, I'm going to make right with others. See, that's how you know a changed heart. I was wrong, now let me make right. All those that he cheated, he's giving. The thing that he held so tightly, again, he had a fortune, it was no longer, that wasn't important to him. He just wanted to be right with God. See, in a rep response to Zacchaeus' actions, then Jesus says in verse 9, Today salvation has come to this house. See, Jesus makes it clear to all who are listening what his mission is in Luke 19.10. And this is a, a beautiful verse, and this was the point of, of what Jesus did when he came into this world. It says, for the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. That's what he did. He came here to seek and save those who are lost. And we were one of those. And now he wants us to to be used by him to also lead people. So follow his example. See, God is a seeker and a saver of the lost. See, understanding the grace of God changed Zacchaeus' heart. And it needs to change our hearts. Zacchaeus was probably the last person expected to interact with Jesus, but this is how the gospel works. Again, throughout Scripture, we see people being used that you wouldn't think would be used. Maybe if we were in control, we say we would have used that person or that person. But Jesus uses people that you wouldn't know because he's awesome. 
We serve an awesome God. And thank God that, that he doesn't look for prestige or anything like that. And he's willing to use a, a little Puerto Rican from, from the Bronx <laughs> to preach his word. Amen? Amen. See, it's, it is sometimes unexpected, but it's always glorious when he uses people and us. See, the question for us are simple. Are we grumbling because others experience grace? We can't do that either. We don't want to be one of those people in the the crowd that start blocking. And I said this weeks ago about blocking. We don't want to be one of those. We want to usher people to Christ. We don't want to block people from Christ. And the second question is, are we willing to share a meal and the grace of God with others who desperately need to know God? See, we're the body of Christ. We're the hands and feet. Are we willing to reach out to those that are lost? Are we willing to, to not only lead someone to Christ, but are we willing to disciple them? Are we willing to mentor them? That's important. He calls us to make disciples, not just, hey, accept me in your heart and then go on with your life. See, the God of the entire universe came among us as a man to show us both the love of the Father and how we are now invited and empowered through his life, death, and resurrection, to live in this world and prepare for the next. See, Christ has come to seek and save the lost. And that is still the mission of the church today. That's the mission of Solid Rock Church. And that's why I brought up in the beginning, as, we were, as, as I opened up, how there's going to be many people coming into this area. Let's not forget about the people that actually live here, though. But I guarantee when we're witnessing to those that are coming in, these large crowds, the people that actually live here, they're going to see it as well. And they're going to start running like Zacchaeus, maybe climbing trees. That'll be something, right? We're preaching the word all the time. I see people on trees. I might get a little scared. But, <laughs> but praise God to see Jesus what are people are going to do? And, and think about it. One thing that I've said or this area, there's a lot of things going on. I had mentioned this way back when I, I think one of my first sermons about the spiritual warfare in this area. Uh, all this witchcraft and all this that's going on. But when God's people hit the pavement and, and run and, and start sharing the word of God, these demonic things, they're not going to be able to be near. I'm sorry. There's no, there's not an equal fight here. You know, it's like, so it's sometimes the, the enemy tries to make it look like it's, it's, it's this equal fight, you know, Satan and God. No, he's a creative being. When we go into a place and bring the light of God with us and we worship, those things have to leave. So, and that's what we're going to do. And I'm, I just can't wait to see what God's going to do through us and what he's going to do in this community. Isaiah um, chapter 1, verse 16 and eight through 18 says this. It says, wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case for the widow. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. It is such a beautiful passage. See, Jesus is pursuing a relationship with you today. And an intimate relationship, and he wants to use each one of us. Amen? If you just bow your heads with me. I want to pray all over all of you. And Heavenly Father, Lord, we come into your presence. We thank you for the love that you have showed us, Lord. We thank you for Calvary. We thank you for the cross. But, Lord, we thank you that it didn't stop at the cross. Lord, it stopped when you rose from the grave. 
and the enemy knew that you had gotten the upper hand, that you were in control of it all. So we thank you for rising again. We thank you, Lord God, that because of you, Lord God, we are a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. We thank you again, Lord, that we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus, Father. I pray, Lord God, that each one of us would walk out of here with that boldness to know, Lord, that we belong to you, Lord. I pray that our relationship with you may grow daily, Lord, that we may hunger and thirst for you, that you may remove any stumbling blocks, anything that tries to hinder us to get closer to you, to, to hear your voice. I pray that you silence any other voice, but allow your Holy Spirit to speak to us, that we may hear your spirit clearly, Lord. I pray for strength. I pray for a healing touch of those that are sick, Lord God. We know, Lord God, like your word says, for man, it, um, things are, um, there are certain things that are, are impossible for man. But for you, Lord God, for the living God, the creator of the heaven and earth, there is nothing, absolutely nothing, impossible for you. And that includes any sickness, Lord. That includes any addiction. That includes anything, Lord God, that the enemy may try to trap us with, Lord. Because, Lord, you are our rescuer and you are our savior, Lord. So, Lord, I just pray, Lord, that we may walk with that in our hearts, knowing and trusting in you, Lord God. You are wonderful, Lord God. We thank you for the story uh, of Zacchaeus, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that we may humble ourselves to you always. Lord, I just leave, my, I leave all of us in your hands. I thank you again for all that you're doing. Guide us and protect us, Lord God. I pray for this fellowship that we'll have downstairs, Lord God, that it may just be a wonderful time, Lord God, that with God's people that we could just share a meal together, a conversation. And Lord, uh, I bless that the food goes to our stomach well, that, that we may enjoy it, and, and, and that we will not gain weight. Lord, I thank you, Lord. <laughs> we praise you, Lord God, because you are so good to us, Lord. And we just give you all the glory and honor. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray, Lord. Amen.